Welcome to the Unfiltered Podcast with hosts Mike D'Alessandro and Jeff Angelo. Unfiltered is based in Clark County, Washington, and is focused on discussing local news and politics. This is episode two, and our guest is Tanisha Harris. And now for the unreal, unrated, unequaled Clark County Podcast, Unfiltered. Welcome to Unfiltered. I'm Mike D'Alessandro along with Jeff Angelo. So today here we have uh, Tanisha Harris who is vice chair of the Clark County Democrats. She also works with uh, the YWCA here locally, and we'll be chatting with her a little bit about that. And um, we want to get right into it. So, Tanisha, why don't you say hello? Hello, gentlemen. (laughs) Hi. (laughs) So, Tanisha. Yes. I know this weekend, uh, this past weekend, you were up in Olympia, for the Washington State Democrat Convention. This is something I won't even presume to know anything about. (laughs) I I really don't. I don't know anything about what you guys do up there. I don't know if you just, you know, meet secretly behind closed doors and try to accomplish anything. I really don't know. So for those of us who don't presume to make any assumptions, tell me what goes on. (laughs) Well, you were on the right path there. There are secret meetings behind closed doors. Who's behind these closed doors? I can't tell you that. Fair enough. But I may be participating in one or two of those secret meetings behind uh, closed doors. We will doors. talk about this more in a few. I'm sure you will. So every two years, the Washington State Democrats have their reorganization meetings. So essentially, we meet together in Olympia, or usually on the west side of the state, to select a new um, chair, vice chair, treasurer, and secretary for the state party. And so this year, it was a contested race. Um, between our um, now former chair, Jackson Ravens, and last year's Secretary of State candidate, Tina Podolowski. And so we had the vote, and Tina is our new chair of the party. Okay. This may sound a little stupid. What does the chair do? What, what, why, who cares? The, the chair is essentially the head of our party in the state of Washington. So they represent the Democrats, you know, across the state, they also are a member of the DNC, so they report back to the DNC, their different meetings. They fundraise for the Democratic Party, they support candidates. You know, every two years when we have different races for LD and State Senate, and every four years for the presidents, and you know, the six years when our senators are up for re-election, they support the coordinated campaign offices across the state. That was a lot of information. I wrote down blah, blah, blah. So well, I think if you, it's a lot of information. I think for you know, if you're a party insider, if you're a member of the party, if you're an mm-hmm. officer, this is something that is part of you know your responsibilities going to the state meetings. They they speak on our behalf. Yes, they represent the party. That cannot be the only thing happening out there. Though. No, probably not. No, I mean there are different meetings. Um, you know, there are different trainings happening. The different caucuses occur you know we have like the african-american that, caucus. the caucuses again i thought we had that last year no. oh god i know oh god am i giving you guys ptsd it's, now those flashbacks we that's not good it. we were in well <laughs> let's not go there this is g-rated well, right. there's a lot of <laughs> <laughs> so you have african-american caucus jewish um hmm. federation of women democrats you have the young democrats rural agricultural caucuses Hispanic, Latino, labor, so, so, so many. At that level, what, what do the caucuses do? Like, what, so what are they for? They gather, and a lot of times it's advocacy work. Okay. So identifying different issues around Washington State that those advocacy groups can get involved in, whether it's legislation, local issues that might be happening. They're also there to support their candidates of their choosing mm-hmm. as well, too. Also, you know, part of the state party meetings is our state committee men and women will go to their different committee meetings and report back to their prospective LDs and counties about what's happening at the state. So going forward then, mm-hmm. Tina yes. is now the chair. What does she do going forward to help us get more Democrats involved with our party? What direction will she take us? I think right now she's looking at who makes up the party? Who are my LD chairs, county chairs? Who's, who's involved currently in the party? And we have a mixture of veteran people, 
longtime members, volunteers, and also a lot of new people who have joined the party the last six or seven months based upon their presidential election and the campaigns this past year, too. So, that, that I'm you? one of them. Yeah. Well, I, I, you know, I wouldn't say I got involved based on the presidential year. I just mm -hmm. think I happened to get involved right when all that other stuff was happening. But yeah, that's why I ask these questions because I'm so new. I'm still yeah. trying to. So learn she's my going. Way. To, she's going to bring you know people together. She's also going to essentially look at the counties and LDs, and she's going to look at upcoming races. What do we have coming up in 2018? She's also already had looking to 2017 now in city and county races across the state. Can the state party have an active role? And what does that role look like? She's going to look at what resources are available. She's going to start fundraising for the party, too. You know, she's going to take a look at all the party business that's been done up to this point. Okay. And, you know, the e-board, the executive board has already met. They met last night after the regular business meeting to start looking at some of these issues as how do we go forward. And she's going to be reaching out to... A lot of people across the state asking them, you know, what are your particular issues? What are your concerns? How can the state party, you know, be of a resource of assistance to you? And, you know, everybody thinks that we are a blue state because our governor is a Democrat and our two senators are Democrats. And we usually, you know, always vote for a Democratic nominee for president. But as some people say, we are a patchwork. You know, we have yeah. blue areas, purple areas, and red areas. And in the past years, we've had some great candidates, Democratic candidates, in those purple red areas, but we're just not be able to break through. And I'd, I'd say the same is true even about our local area here in mm -hmm. Clark County. It is a lot of patchwork. Yep. I mean, you yes. see a lot of red, a lot of purple, a lot of blue, depending on whether you're in the northeast or southwest, I guess. Sure, yeah. <clears throat> but... Um, Going forward, so she will actively help candidates in our area in Clark County. Part of, one of the things is that people, I always say, sometimes the party can identify a candidate. Sometimes the candidate will identify themselves. You know, if we've seen that before. We've self -identity. seen Self-identity. Self-identity. You know, we've seen that before because, as I've always said, filing week always brings out surprises and for everybody. Yep. So you never know which candidate is going to file and they might turn out to be a great candidate or sometimes we might have you know groomed somebody or vetted somebody and said we really want you to run and they sometimes turn out not to be a great candidate and so for the state party it's working more closely with the LDs and the county and our democratic allies you know how we go forward and how do we develop good candidates quality candidates but at, for me, at the end of the day, I, it's about the candidate, candidate. It's about having a campaign strategy, knowing your district or the race you're in, knowing the issues, and also it's about luck and time, timing. Mm -hmm. Timing is everything, and you have to have some skills and some luck to go, go along with it. And you might not make it the first time around. I certainly understand that firsthand. You know, so some days you might have to come back a second time or even a third time, but I think you have to be smart about it. Been there. <laughs> yes, you have. <laughs> and we are grateful that you did not give up, and now you're a great councilman for the wow. city of Battleground. You're running for re-election. Great might be an overstatement. But Just councilman. You. Just councilman. We're fine with councilman. <laughs> I like the term great myself. So I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to veer off of politics just for a second okay. here and talk about, uh, I'd like to ask you about what you do for in, you know, your everyday job. Can you, can, you, can you talk to us about that? The normal world. The, the normal, normal world. world. Outside of this. How I pay my bills. Is there you go. Okay. Yeah, there you go. So I am a CASA program specialist, and CASA stands for Court Appointing Special Advocate. Okay. And I work at the YWCA of Clark County. And essentially what we do in CASA, or as we like to call it, CASA land, we are in advocates. CASA, is CASA? Yes. Yeah, okay. C. We. <laughs> my extent of Spanish is right, right there. <laughs> That's so. about mine too. Right. We are advocates for our kids who are in the foster care system, dependency system. Okay. So we represent their best interests in court. We visit them, um, whether they're living with their parents, a relative, um, in a foster home, mm -hmm. we make sure that their educational medical needs are being taken care of, 
if there's any issues surrounding behavior or mental health issues, we want to advocate that they get those needed resources as well. We are obli- we're um, court mandated reporters too, so we have to be aware of any physical abuse mm. or psychological, emotional abuse, and sexual abuse mm. that might be happening too. Um, we are mandated to report to the court every six months of how our kids are doing in their current situation, their current home. So, so, how, so, so you're working with, with children? So working with children, Advocating yeah. for children. Yes. So how many children are you working with at a given time? Like how many, how many are you working with? Well, right now, the CASA program in Clark County, we represent a little bit over 600 kids in the okay. foster care system. Okay. So we have kids who are brand new babies mm-hmm. up to the age of 18. Okay. Most of our kids that we do advocacy work for are 12 and under. But we do have kids who are teenagers. I have several teenagers who I work with. Getting to a national level here for a second, we've had a change in the guard. Yes. Very big change in the guard. Very big change. And a lot of <clears throat> groups, a lot of nonprofits, I guess, are worried uh, about what this new presidency means to federal funding. So is that something that... Uh, the YWCA has been expressing it all? Is this something they talk about? Yes, the YWCA. So our mission at the YWCA is empowering women, eliminating racism. Mm -hmm. And we have both um, our local CASA and also the YWCA um, USA um, organization has taken a public stance against several of the nominees of this current administration. Yeah, it's a uh, it's sad to say, but you guys got your work cut out for you based on that platform. We do, you know, and you know the CASA, you know, our funding comes through certain sources, but also at the YWCA we have our domestic violence shelter um, safe choice program, our independent living skills program, our Wise Cares that works with low income children, our preschool um, program. So we have a number of programs that get sources funding sources both nationally and through the state and so depending on who's which these different you know cabinet choices you know are selected or ultimately appointed you know what their philosophy is when it comes to social justice programs and nonprofits um, it is going to have an effect because it'll have effect at the state level which means it'll have effect on the local level too yeah, one you know one of the things that I saw last week. I know I talked to a Mike. I was up in Olympia last week. One of the things that came through there, and I'm I'm still kind of trying to understand how legislation works, but I saw something how kind of, sausage is made. How sausage is made, where the Republicans came to the floor um, to fully fund education. And they said, you know, we want to fully fund education. We don't understand why the Democrats don't want to fully fund education. Uh, I want my kid to be able to go to school and not worry about their education being funded. This makes a lot of sense. And I was watching from the gallery upstairs Mm -hmm. there. And I was like, that makes a lot of sense. That really, you know what you say, what is wrong with the The Democrats? Yeah, the devil is in the details. Later on, when I finally got to hear the length of what really was going on, it was that they wanted to cut out um, some of the Medic- Medicare, Medicaid programs. Mm-hmm. That, I mean, it was basically, we are going to put all the schools first, mm-hmm. but then if we can't pay the bills of these other places, mm-hmm. we're just not going to do it, and that's the way it is. Well, and they keep repeating that over and over again. They'll get enough people to believe that. It, it so really, the devil, yeah. you know, the details, you know, you have to look at what exactly they're proposing. And I do believe it was one of the Republican who said, we're not going to show you the plan. They don't. I mean, they keep saying that, but they're just, you know, they're, they're not going to do anything unless, until we actually see it. And so they're hoping that people just believe them when they say that. And, I mean, there are going to be two different plans as to how to fully fund education. And they will. They will say, we're going to cut out these social justice programs, these social service programs. I went up there just thinking, you know, one plus one is two, but they're trying to pass it off as one plus one equals four. Trust me on this. Not in the legislative process. <laughs> it, is, it is just insane up there sometimes. Logic is absent from politics a lot of the time. A lot of the time. It is. It is no joke. 
So I got a question for you. Yes. We're going to veer off of, of this even a little further. Are we going to go personal questions now? I oh, no. Want, I do want to ask <coughs> you I'm kind of worried. It is Sunday. <laughs> Be nice to me. It's Sunday. I would like to ask you, though, is yes. tell us something about yourself that you think most people would not know. Do you guys think about that one? You know, people would probably be surprised to know that I love the band ABBA. <laughs> I didn't see that coming. Like Dancing Queen? Yes, dan- I, that is my, oh that my, is my theme gosh. song. Was SOS, the- Knowing You, Knowing Me, I love. Oh my gosh. What was that Mamma Mia movie? Yes, was Meryl Street. Yes, Meryl yes. Street, yeah, yeah. All right, all right. My wife watches that. I'd like to say that's a great answer, but I can't stand ABBA, but, but thank you for sharing. Thank <laughs> no you problem. Sharing. Give, give me a break. You've never been in your car, turned on the Apple music, and you just You know to Dancing ABBA Queen is your theme, Mike. You know it is. I despise that song. I do, I do, I despise it. And I love music, but I can't stand ABBA, so. Well, There's I no will offense. say. No offense. No offense. 100%. Taken. Like, it is. I, I don't care who sees inside of my closet. I'm pretty much an open book. <laughs> I will drive with my son down the road and we'll toss on ABBA and sing it on the road. And mm-hmm. I go crazy to it. You know what? I sing Sia out loud in my car. You know what's in my phone right now on don't the way here? Somebody to Love by Queen. Yes, I'm, Queen is the best. Queen yes. is awesome. And I'll take. I'll even take Under Pressure with David Bowie and Freddie Mercury. I'll do both parts with my son in the car. <laughs> we'll just go all over wow. the place with it. It's great, man. You yeah. need to live a little, Mike. He does need to live a I little. Don't, I don't, yeah, I don't. I'm a sheltered life. So. He does lead a sheltered life. It's What's true. going on out there in Battleground? You don't. You guys don't like music out there or oh, something? I, I am I am well-rounded when it comes to music, <laughs> with the exception of ABBA. So. No, I heard that you're a Frank Sinatra fan. I love Sinatra. I yep. do, I do. I like he Sinatra He's a, a big lot. Sinatra fan. I am. I am. Yeah. It's probably the Italian thing, but, mm-hmm. you know, I don't know. I just love it. Hey, I, one, one other thing I thought was really interesting that I want to talk about uh, is your, your family history. Okay. And I know you've brought up before in the past that your family is one of the first African-American families in Clark County. Yes. What? So can you, can you talk about that a little bit? Oh, my, my, so my, my dad is African-American, my mom is white, and during the World War II with the shipyards, you know, a lot of African-Americans from the South and from California Midwest, in the Midwest uh, migrated out here um, to Portland or hmm. Vanport to be Vanport, exact. Vanport, yeah, that's crazy. You know, to work in the shipyards and work on you know the railroads. And after World War II, a lot of families, African American families, either stayed or in Portland or went back to where they originally, you know, came from. Mm-hmm. But a lot of them went back to their families. And my dad's family, the Harris family, decided you know they wanted to make Vancouver home. So they are one of the first African American families here in Clark County. Cool. Yeah. Wow, that's neat. That's really neat. See, Jeff didn't know that. So I there, there's even a book. I should have brought the book. You could have read the book. It's called The First Families. No kidding. Yeah, it was it was published a couple of years back by. Uh, I love Clark County history. Mm-hmm. I have a lot of Clark County history. You books. do. I, I really do. I, I go to Pat Gelada. I talk to her a little bit. <laughs> she Pat. always gets me a signed book to take <laughs> yeah. home. One last question for me, and then I'll turn it back over to... You Ms. know you want to ask a question. Go ahead and ask the question. I'm going to ask you this one last question. Yes. You know, you're, uh, you've are you been involved in politics for, for quite a while now. It seems like you, forever. You, you ran for office last year. Yes, I did. So um, when are you running again? When am I running again? <laughs> that is a great question. <laughs> And you're not the first person. You know, once you run, that's the question everybody always asks. Everybody always asks, what are your plans next? What are your plans next? I said this last year during the campaign. You find yourself with options. Sometimes Mm -hmm. you're just blessed with options Mm -hmm. and opportunities. And I am a firm believer that you should take advantage of all the opportunities that you've been given in this life. And, but with that comes a lot of soul searching as to really what you want to do with your life, personally and professionally. Mm -hmm. And when you're thinking about running for office, you have to say, is this something I really want? Why do I want to do this? And is it a good fit for me? Am I right for the community at the time? Mm -hmm. And, you know, I did not intend to run for public office. That was something that was never, you know, in my mind to run. I was always kind of behind the scenes working on campaigns. Mm -hmm. And so when an opportunity presented itself and I really took the time to think about is this really what I want and can I help and better the community? And is somebody like me and my voice is needed? 
And so this year in 2017, you know, there are opportunities, both 2017 and 2018. So I am taking advantage of these options that have been in front of me, and I am thinking about everything. All right. Nothing is off the table. I'm thinking about everything, and, you know, there's a, a lot of support for me from a lot of people in the community to, you know, campaign once again and be a public servant. And so I'm going to take advantage of that, and I'll let you guys know first what so we'll I plan tuned. on doing. We'll stay tuned. Stay tuned. Stay right. tuned. There might be breaking news. Anytime so, soon. You never know. You heard it here first. <laughs> Tanisha Harris, 3rd Congressional District. Oh. You know what? I love Washington, D.C. The cherry blossoms in springtime on the Potomac River <laughs> by the Thomas Jefferson Memorial are is the best. So I might, you know, I might you run for Congress. You can't count it out, right? We already have a couple more candidates. We already have like three candidates in the race right oh, now. We do, yeah. I mean, we do, I yeah. should just jump in and just muddy all the waters up <laughs> even more. <laughs> That would be great. You know what? It. It's one of those yeah. Filing Friday surprises, right? It is. Yeah. Oh, filing my God. Friday. That would be the best you know what? Filing you know Friday what? surprise ever. If all of a sudden that filing ever. week, you don't see me in Clark County because you can't file in Clark County for Congress, just somebody put out, you know, a you know, you know, missing person's mm -hmm. report going, where's Tanisha at? Mm -hmm. I might be filing for something. Mm -hmm. I will be honest. With as many candidates that are in the race right now, they will be locking arms like a little Red Rover situation <laughs> down there and not letting you get through there at this point. So we are going to change. Thank you for the q and You're mean, welcome. I'm glad to hear that you'll be running again this year. So <laughs> it's, it's great you to You want to clarify that? I don't what? think I said that. Possibly. I was it sounded like running again this year. Possibly. Possibly. Heard it here first. Tanisha Harris running again. Okay. <laughs> so we're going to go ahead. You know what, Angelo? And... You need to watch yourself. <laughs> Roy told me. I blame just... Roy. That's what we do around here in the Democrats' <laughs> office. We blame Roy when for everything. When he can't talk, I blame him all the time. <laughs> That's... So uh, we're, we want to talk about a little bit about the protests that are happening yes. at the airports. And uh, what's going on at this national level? We've been seeing more protests than I, I'm 37 I at this point. I've never seen. I've that. never seen this many oh, protests ever in my life. The last two weeks have been, I mean, amazing. I mean, I think regardless of how you feel, if if, if you're listening to this and you're a conservative and you think the protests are just out of line, just the idea that the protests are happening. It's big. And, and, and this protest that started, was it yesterday? It's completely organic. Mm -hmm. it, wasn't, it wasn't coordinated or planned. It's been organic. Uh, it's really amazing and, I, and, there's, and, and leaves you wondering, like, what, what does this all mean? I think Trump has awoken people of every background um, because what you're, I, I participated last week in the Women's March in Portland mm -hmm. and 100,000 people. And I marched with my mom and my friend Candy and our cousin Sue. And to think that when my mom and I, we were down there in our pink Planned Parenthood shirts. And to think that her and I, you know, are marching together and the issues that brought us to Portland to march on that day. You know, you saw so many people, so many different backgrounds marching for a lot of different issues. And yeah. now, you know, with the um, protests at the airport, you know, my personal opinion is the things that you are seeing, the rhetoric, the executive orders mm -hmm. that are coming from this administration, I personally believe it's, it's fascism. This is how things start. And I think people are remembering history and they are rising up, and they, they don't want to see us go backwards. They want to see us move forward. You know, one of the things that I remember reading just a couple days ago, and I've been following a little bit, is the loss of federal funding for sanctuary cities. That's the most deplorable, horrific thing. One of them. It's just something that it, it hits so local for us because we're right across the river from Portland, <laughs> Um, the mayor has stood up over there saying we will stay true to our neighbors. These people are our family. We are a community over here. Um, we're standing with them. Um, what, what do we do? I mean, my God, I'm losing my mind here. I, I don't even know how we proceed at the, this point. The, this past week has been just so hard to even stay on top of what's going on. Every day there's multiple executive orders things being tweeted, said, that I, I, I'm having a hard time keeping track of all of it. And uh, I know there's more to come. I mean, this week coming up, we're going to have a Supreme Court nominee uh, announced. 
that's going to cause a stir because I'm sure it's going to be somebody that we uh, not everybody agrees with and it's mm-hmm. going to cause some issues. It, it's just been, again, you say people have been awoken. Again, I wonder what's going to happen. Is this going to continue? Are we going to continue to see public protests? Are we going to see this happening and for how much longer? It's really, because it, it's just an amazing, I don't know, I have another word for it, but it's an amazing time. It's historic, I think, what's going on right now. You know, it's crazy to me because I remember during Obama's presidency where I would think to myself, what if North Korea does something crazy, like sends a nuke our way or something like that? The missile actually I gets haven't thought the about ground, North Korea. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. Yes. Even if they make it two miles out of there, they, they took the shot. As opposed to the one mile <laughs> before, yes. Yeah. Yes. But... I have not thought about North Korea in a long, long time at this point. I really don't. I have no. I think that they, at this point, are just like, well, they're screwed. We're moving on to other things. Well. Because, my God, the North Korea doesn't even make the news nowadays. They could have fired at us 30 times. We would have no idea because we haven't focused on them at all. They're a non-factor right well, it's now, because, it feels like. Because we are, ups- I mean, and this is another issue that I have as well. I, I'm not a big fan of the media either. The media is, every time Donald Trump tweets something, and again, he says some stuff that's out there, we're all focused on what Donald Trump is saying, the tweets, how crazy they are or whatever. And or from his mean unsecured spirited, Twitter account. From unsecured Twitter yeah. account. Again, you know, I, I, we're, we're, we're being told, we're, he's, doing, he's have, doing all these executive orders, these actions <clears> are happening, and on the other hand, he's, he's kind of just distracting us, I think, a lot of times with, with a lot of these, these comments. I feel like we're. I feel like there's so much going on right now that we're getting distracted. That something's happening that we're not seeing. You know that something's happening. He, he, and the right. Anger makes you feel irrational. Yeah. You don't pay attention. Something's to, happening. It gives you tunnel vision, and you're f- so focused on that because you want to get well, in there and like the magician, right? And change it. Slide of yeah, hand. Slide look of over hand. Here, look, look over here. And doing something over here. Well, yeah. what's happening is that he is governing off of slogans and campaign promises through these executive orders. But what's really coming and what people don't quite, I don't think, are paying attention to, I think some people are, is the legislation that is slowly making its way through, you know, the House and the Senate side. And that will eventually make it to the Oval Office for him to sign. That's, That's the key thing. And if Trump was smart in all of this, it was picking somebody like Pence as his vice president because Pence Pence does understand legislation and governance and how the hill works how the you know the senators and the congressmen and women work and so I think Trump is fine with these executive orders and he's letting the puppets in the background the you know the boogeyman in the background kind of do everything and it's that legislation that you're going to see at the national level and, that, that's the and thing. then the states too what the, how are the states going to respond as well too you know so right now this is getting all the headlines but you know the actual governance of the day-to-day governance of our country i think is at stake mm-hmm. because we're too busy about executive order it's setting it's setting up everything that's going to follow here and part of the problem that i hear from a lot of people was yeah trump's bad but pence is awful you know i <laughs> i hear a lot of people say that so we got to get both of them we it is i no longer feel safe in our in our nation where we should feel safe all the time. Um, you know, I look at myself as, as a feminist. And I love women. And I want them to have all the rights they want. They are better than men. They are superior to men. I don't care who in this room thinks it. If they, if you can have a kid, you're superior to men by a long shot. Amen. You really don't need us. Amen. Down the road, you're not going to need men. And then we're going to have to come up with a reason why you need us. I think we're already on that plane at this point. So... I just, I have a tough time <clears throat> going forward. I just think I'm looking for answers and solutions to the hand we've been dealt. Because it's been an awful hand. It's like we're carrying a two and a seven offsuit in a po- poker game and we have nowhere to go here. We're supposed to be united. And we're always supposed to give the incoming administration an opportunity, a chance to see what they're about. But what has happened in the first week of this presidency is unbelievable. And I think, you know, some people will say, oh, I saw it coming if we, you know, when he said this or did this. Mm-hmm. But until it actually is happening, you're like, oh, my gosh, what what do I do? And I think yeah. the, the good thing is there's enough groups out there. There's enough legal groups, advocacy groups, 
um, organizations who have been at this for a very long time and will continue doing doing so. I think it's important that people still be engaged, you know, talk to their neighbors, family, friends, what's going on, demand and ask questions, you know, start reaching out to your local representatives, you know. Yeah. So I don't think we're, people are going to back down from this. I think people are going to channel their energies into a certain organization or group that they feel they can do the most good in. And we have a lot of good people who are going to be watching out for us. And, yeah. you know, as a Democrat, you know, I, I hope the Democrats remain strong. I hope that our newly elected leadership here in Washington State, Tina and Joe, are committed and focused, and I think they are. I mean, if you saw Tina in action last year when she was campaigning for Secretary of State, she does not back down. She doesn't back down. So I think for the state of Washington, we know how to move forward. Our governor took a stand yesterday. Our two senators are taking a stand mm -hmm. every day and everything that they are, are doing back in Washington, D.C. on our behalf, too. So I think you will see a coalition of groups standing together, moving forward, and it's just asking that the American people pay attention because so many different things are going to affect your family. Yeah, and I think it's good to say you brought up being a Democrat. Mm -hmm. I just think humanity in general. Yes. I mean, we're all here together trying to fill in the pieces where a lot of a bunch of different puzzle pieces that we're yes. trying to fit together. We need to have more constructive conversations with each other. We need to make sure that we're helping out our fellow man. Whether I disagree or agree with you, I never want anyone to just get left behind. I don't want an immigrant neighbor of mine. I don't I don't want anyone. We're all immigrants. Yes. So I I don't want anyone to feel like they cannot make it here because of policy. I don't want policy to enact change that's going to make sure that next week we have uh, services coming out here to deplete them of what they have come to our country to earn. Cuz it's not right. It is not right in any scale, any level that we've ever seen. It's definitely been a wake up call. It really has been. It really has been, but you know, <laughs> I think we've I think we've gone on a bit too long here uh, on this, but Thank you. Thank you for all your conversation with us today, Tanisha. You're welcome. It was fun. Yes, thank you. <laughs> it was thank you. fun. Do we have anything positive real quick? Can we can well, we get anything positive out of this conversation at the very end here? Yes, we can. Good. Yeah. Upcoming events. There we go. There we go. We'll go there. So the Clark County Democratic Central Committee meeting, yep. which is where uh, Tanisha will be, Monday, February 13th, 6.30 at the Labor Hall on Andreessen across from uh, Winco. We'll have Valentine's Day cookies. There you go. In a See? hot room. Yes. Perfect. <laughs> it's a, it's a nice and warm in that place. Well, that's um, so that's all the time we have here. Thanks, Mike, for filling us in with the meeting coming up. Uh, this is Jeff Angelo, Tanisha Harris, Mike D'Alessandro. Thank you for joining us today. The Unfiltered Podcast is sponsored by the Clark County Democrats. Thank you for listening.